here today. I said we have Kona Ice here today. Anyway, the kids love it, but uh, hope you get some. My name's Darren. If it's your first time, if you're new, if somebody dragged you in here, uh, we're glad that you're here. Restrooms are in the lobby. Coffee is in the lobby. Espresso bar is in that room back there. Help yourself. Uh, we are excited about today, excited about uh, spending some time together, and uh, I want to Talk for just a second. You guys should have seen Jeff Kuda. This is Jeff Kuda, everybody. Give her Jeff Kuda. You should have seen Jeff Kuda leading worship at summer camp this summer. It was awesome. He got mobbed by the football team at one point. They came down. They were fighting him. He fought back while singing songs. It was amazing. They felt the Lord in that moment. Uh, it was really good. But um, it was a great, great time at summer camp. It was so good. I I just am so excited about what God is doing in this community with the young people. We really believe that the next generation, it matters. That uh, what I found uh, living here, that everyone I talk to uh, has, been, has grown up here. Like, people don't leave Santa Rosa. Everyone I talk to, I'm like, so where are you from? They're like, down the street. Uh, 
I'm like, oh, cool. So, so occasionally someone will be like, oh, I moved, I moved here from Roner Park. It's a big move for me. Uh, traumatic, you know, really had to make new friends, a whole new community. Um, but a lot of people grow up here, live here, stay here, and we, we really believe that we can impact the city of Santa Rosa as we impact the next generation who will probably grow up and live here and be a part of our community. And so um, a, about two years ago, we had about 12 students hanging out at a pool party at Natalie and Adam's house. It was a, I'm sure it was a great pool party, uh, but there was not a lot of action. And uh, this past week, we took 200 middle school and high school students to uh, summer camp Woodleaf, which is so cool. I would love to take credit for it. I'd love to get the credit for it because I'm a credit hog. We all are. Everybody wants to be known for something great, but we can't take the credit for it. It's what God's doing. In our office, we have this pretend box. It's not a real box, but we we say, hey, after we share a win or something, we say, okay, now let's take all the credit from what we just talked about. Let's scoop it up, and let's put it in the, in the God box because God gets the credit. We don't get our credit. We, we keep our hands off the credit. And one of the reasons we keep our hands off the credit is it also allows us to keep our hands off the failure. When we fail, it's terrible. It's also not our fault, okay? So we take, keep our hands off the credit. But God gets the credit for what happened. So let me show you a little bit of pictures from summer camp. Check it out. Seventy adults, over 70 of you came to serve in the kitchen, wash dishes, make meals, and serve as small group leaders uh, and the production team. It was so great to do it as a church together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, would you give it up for all the people who came and served that <laughs> camp? Awesome, awesome event to do together as a church. And so there's a lot more going on around here besides students. I'm going to tell you more about what's coming up, about our new series, about our guest speaker today, about all the things happening after we sing a little bit together, and, and this room fills up a little bit more as people get here, uh, get finished out of the Coda Ice line. But we're going to sing a few songs right now. If you're new, we do this uh, to connect with God. And we're going to put the words on the screens. If you don't know the words, if you're not a singer, you can just read it. You can just connect with God in your own way. But we do this to take a moment and just connect with God on a personal level we're here together in a community, but you can have a personal moment with God as we worship together. You tell him uh, that you love him when you, you allow his love to cover you. And so that's why we sing together. And so uh, Jeff and the band is going to lead us. Aaron and Jeff and the band, they're going to lead us. Why don't you stand up, tell somebody how much coffee you've had today and how wound up you are. So let's go. Well, good morning, New Vintage. We're going to do a song called House of the Lord. It's a song we did at camp. It was so fun. It just got stuck in my head over and over and over again. It became my kind of anthem. I wanted to share it with you guys. It's such a good, feel-good song. So I encourage you just to read these lyrics, sing them out from your heart, and uh, just press in this morning. Amen. We were 
worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. As he opened the prison doors, part of the raging sea, our God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise.
Lord, declare now. As the Spirit was moving over the water, the Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, the Spirit come move over us.
stay in this place right now. Declare these words this morning. Just let God meet you where you are this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like the fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety. Every soul kept captive by depression.
give him a shout this morning. Hey, Amen. You guys sound beautiful. You can have a seat. We're going to speak the name of Jesus over uh, Quinn. Uh, Quinn is, uh, come on over here, Quinn, real quick. I know you love the spotlight. Quinn uh, is, dude, two days? Two days, and she's here playing for you this morning. So, uh, Quinn, we're praying for you, for your child, and for that, uh, the next couple days as you, and, and don't, um, take at least a week off, okay, before you come back, all right? Hey, give it up for Quinn, you're awesome, we're so grateful to have you. I know, I have had more people say to me, you got to make sure that, that violin player is here all the time, so uh, we're praying for a quick uh, recovery and everything, you know, come on back, but you're awesome, but let me just pray for you. Uh, God, we pray for Quinn and her child and her family. We just ask for everything to go well, safe. We thank you for her service and the way she comes to show up and to serve this place and this church and these people. We just are so grateful for her. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Quinn. You're awesome. There's a big wall out there that says people who care. There's a big wall that says for the city. We want to be people who care for the people of our city. That's our hope. That's why we have... All those young, those kids come to, to summer camp. That's why we're following up with all of them. We have a plan to help them connect with Jesus. But that's not all we're doing. That our, my hope is that this church, this place, becomes a place of incredible influence all over this city for every age, from babies to nursing homes. And so we have something called The Grid. It's for our 20s and 30s. Uh, it's July 27th. It's a Wednesday night. We're going to have live music. We want young adults in this community to know there's a place to make great friends. There's a place you can find your people and find your place, and many already have. We have a group for, for folks that are a little bit older than 20 or 30. It's called Legacy Group. If you're in the retirement years, that you would finish well, and we have a place for you to connect as well. And we can do all kinds of things for, for, for little ones, all the way up to older folks, uh, people that are more mature, uh, because of your generosity, because you give. Uh, the dreams and the goals I have for this place and this city, uh, they're kind of massive. God dropped Molly and I here a couple years ago, and we just believe that God's doing something big in this city. We believe that he wants to reveal himself and show himself. We believe our job as a church is to tell the people of this city that God loves them. And they may never love him back. And that's okay. Our job's not to make people love God. Our job is to help people know that God loves them. And they might say back, well, I don't even believe in God. That's cool. He loves you. He, 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 we, they might say, well, I don't even think that you're, I, we don't even like Christians or church. We hate church. That's cool. God loves you. We, we, we don't even know if we like any of the stuff you're doing. We heard that you guys are like weird and you sing songs. That's cool. God loves you. That's our goal, to help this city know that there's a God who loves them. And we do that through generosity. We do that through service. We do that through loving young people. We do it through giving our time, our effort, and our energy away for the people of this city. We want the city to know that God loves them right where they are. And if you're here today, it's your first time, and you're like, what is this place about? This place is about being for you and letting you know that God loves you. Whatever the journey is that you're on, wherever you are in that process, we believe that God loves you. That's important for you to know that. It's going to take sacrificial giving. It's going to take generosity like we've never seen before. If we're going to really impact this city and go from this corner to the next corner and the next street and the next and the next, from this school to that school and that school, we're going to, we're going to take, it's going to take extreme generosity on our part. That's what God calls us to, though. When, when God gives us and blesses us with jobs and finances, it's really not ours. It's His. And he says, use what I've given you for the good of others. We use what we have for the good of others. It changes something inside of us. So we thank you for your generosity. And we ask that you continue to be generous, that we can go and do and serve in this city to let the people of Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, know there's a God who loves them. So you can give through uh, the envelopes in the back, online, newvintage.org slash give, or through this hard-to-remember phone number up here on the screen another way you can do it. You can text it in. But we are so grateful for your generosity. 
bit of good news. We said we're going to redo these seats because they're 45 years old. People keep ruining their dresses. We get grease on people. People fall through them. We have to tape them up so that you can't sit on certain seats. All the money's come in. They're paid for. We've placed the order. We're getting new seats in here. So way to go. Great job. Because we're going to have a place for everyone who gets invited to come have a place where they can sit and discover that maybe they could love God too. So thank you for doing that. That'll be in October. There'll be a couple weeks when um, there are no seats in here. You'll bring a lawn chair, and we'll be fine. We'll figure it out. Uh, but that's going to happen coming up. We're going to be inviting some of you to come rip all these out with us and throw them in a dumpster at some point. So just look for your email. Check every email because that's coming at some point. All right. Hey, today you're going to be so glad that you're here today. Um, one of my good friends is here. Uh, we're doing a series this summer called Summer Jam. We've invited different voices to come in and speak today. And I've invited one of my good friends, uh, Lee Jenkins, to be here today. And uh, some of you saw him in the barbershop episode we did a while back. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, Lee is a great encourager. And um, today I've asked him to come talk about kind of a heavy topic and to tell a little bit about, um, about talk a little bit about race and diversity. And you guys know we've been talking about this, if you've been here at all, that, that we merge with the Spanish church, uh, that we want this place to be a place where everybody feels welcome, that everybody doesn't need to look alike in this space. We want this to be the most diverse place in Sonoma County to come discover church and discover God. But Lee's not just great at talking about that, he's a great friend. Uh, when I was, when I had recently been uh, fired, terminated, um, I was sitting in a coffee shop licking my wounds, and he came over, and he said, hey, what are you doing right now? And I said, crying, um, sad, you know. Uh, and he said, well, I've, I've got these pastors I'm talking to, and some of the guys that I've asked to come speak to them about student ministry, they, they weren't able to make it today. Could you come talk to them right now? And I was like, right now? He's like, yeah, come talk to him right now. And I was like, what do you want me to say? He's like, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you to say stuff. I don't know what you're going to say. I said, all right. So I walk in there, and I start talking to these pastors who I don't know about student ministry. And Lee, I wrote a devotional about this for our daily bread. And Lee encouraged, he changed my world with one word. And he said the same word over and over again. As I started talking to these, these pastors, Lee sat right next to me, and he went, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. That's so good. And in that moment, I thought to myself, maybe I'm not awful at this. Maybe God has different plans for me. Maybe I could actually do this pastor thing because I was ready to quit and give up. And that one word, wow, encouraged me. And I know today, as you sit here, and you're going to sit here longer than you normally do because I've asked Lee to share all, as much as he can. Because it would be a shame to bring him out here on a flight from Atlanta to San Francisco and say, you got 20 minutes. That's stupid. I said, Lee, take what you need to teach us about what it means to be the kind of people that have eyes to see the way Jesus sees the world. And so he's going to teach you this morning. You're going to be encouraged this morning. You are going to be so glad that you tuned in online or came here person in person to listen and hear from my good friend, Lee Jenkins. It's going to be so good for you. So if you have kids over there in child care, go ahead and prepare yourself for the fact that you have to leave here right away and get them when we're late, okay? Because we're going to be late because I've asked him to, to keep going. I've asked him to just, just whatever it takes to teach us, it's too valuable to shorten it. So um, it's not going to be like three days or anything like that, but it's going to be longer than normal, okay? So just prepare yourself for that. But let me pray for us, and then we're going to invite Lee to come share with us. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for providing for us and meeting our needs. God, we thank you that you made all kinds of people. Would you help us to be the kinds of people who love all the people that you made? And God, would you help us this morning to have eyes to see and ears to hear what you want to teach us so that our church and this group of people in this city can be better at loving the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Wow. 
Thank you, New Vintage Church. It is so great to be here. Let me just start off by saying, Darren, it is very dangerous to tell a black pastor to take as long as you want. Okay? Because, see, to us, that's like 2 or 3 o'clock y'all be getting out of here, okay? But don't worry. I'm not going to keep you that long, I promise you. So Darren called me a few weeks ago. He said, hey, man, do you believe in free speech? I said, I sure do. He said, good. I need you to come up here to New Vintage and do one. So that's what he said. So I'm here. I have been looking forward to this. Darren Youngstrom and his wife, Molly, are dear friends. And uh, I have been an encourager in his life. And that is because I'm so impressed with what God is doing with his life. In fact, when he uh, got fired, uh, I, 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 I called uh, Andy Stanley and I said, hey man, I, this guy would fit perfect in our church. And by the way, our church is predominantly African American, even though we are located in a very uh, affluent suburban white community, we feel like one of our callings is to continue to be who we are culturally and so forth, and then invite white people, invite uh, Latinos, just invite Asians, invite them to the party. That's the way we look at it. So our contribution to diversity is not to necessarily assimilate, but to invite people into what we are doing. And so one of the strategies we had is I said, man, we need a strong white leader. You know, and all of our leadership team said, Darren Youngstrom, that's who we need. So we offered him a job, and he took the job, and then about three weeks later, he came and he said, hey, man, there's this church out in California uh, that's inquiring about me, and um, I'm not sure, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if I even want to do it, man, but what, what do you think about it? I said, by all means, go. But he said something that really hit me. He said, during this time of COVID, leadership is needed. And he said, I just feel like I'm supposed to be pouring into people and, and leading. And I knew that was, uh, as we say a lot, the word of the Lord. I knew that was God speaking through him. So I began to pray. And of course, he came here, fell in love with you guys, and you all fell in love with him. And it is great. So can we give uh, Darren a great big round of applause? Yes. Awesome leader. Awesome leader, awesome friend. How many of you all saw that little barbershop a video that we did a couple of years ago? Yeah, that, that was, yes. So Darren, he is uh, an unofficial kind of African-American. That's what we, we call him white chocolate at our church, okay? That's what we call him, white chocolate, all right? But we love this man. We love him. Hey, let me tell you a little bit about my family and uh, about myself. Check out this picture. This is my family, just so you know who we are. Yes, that's my family. In fact, my beautiful wife is sitting right over there. Been married for 34 years, you all. Yes. She's a California girl. She grew up in Los Angeles, and she was a... Uh, uh, L.A. Raider cheerleader back in the mid-80s, and uh, yeah, so she's a big, big Raider fan, even though they're in Las Vegas now. Uh, to the far right is my daughter. She's 32 years old. Uh, she lives in Los Angeles now. And then the guy on this, on this knee at the bottom, that's my son who's 30 years old. His name is Martin. He's in the insurance business and uh, in Atlanta. And then my son on the far, your far left, is Ryan, and he's in ministry full-time and Phoenix, Arizona. Now, why do I want to show you this picture? Because all three of my children have been impacted by Darren Youngstrom, all three of them. He helped disciple my children when they were in high school, and he was with a, a ministry called Student Ventures. I believe they're part of Crew. Uh, and uh, before he went uh, into local church ministry, and Darren has an incredible legacy in the Atlanta area. There are so many people who he has impacted. So as a parent, there's nothing like having somebody else to reinforce what you're telling your children at home. Because every now and then, they'll, they'll tune you out. And you need somebody else. It's amazing, my kids would come home and tell me what Darren said. And I was like, gee, I just told you that two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, why is that such a deep revelation now, you know? And all of a sudden, you get it. But that's how it is. We all need help. 
So uh, let me show you a little bit about kind of my life, just so you know where I'm coming from, um, because we're going to be talking about a very sensitive subject. We're going to have some fun with it, though. In fact, I was thinking about a story I heard about a black guy and a white guy, and they were arguing about what color God was. You know, the black guy said, man, I know God is African-American because he has soul, man. I know he's African-American. The white guy said, no, man. He said, I don't want to offend you, man, but the Bible says, you know, the earth is the Lord's and everything, and white people own everything. So that's what, they, that's what he was saying. You know, it's kind of cold. I was like, oh, that's cold. Of course, they were just kidding back and forth, you know. So, uh, Anyway, they were in a car accident. They were arguing, got in a car accident. Both of them lost their life, and they woke up in heaven, and they were still arguing. <laughs> like, no, God is black. The other guy said, no, God is white. So St. Peter came over and said, look, guys, y'all got to stop this. This is heaven. We don't have arguments in heaven. By the way, what are you arguing about? Well, we want to know what ethnic or what et ethnicity God is. And Peter said, oh, man, that's easy. He's going to be coming out. In just about two seconds. One, two, the curtains opened. God came out. He says, Que pasa, senores? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we really don't know. Okay, what color God is? God represents all of us. Well, here's a picture of me when I was a little kid uh, with my dad and my sister. And the reason I show this picture is because my sister at that time. You see the dolls she has? They are two white dolls. So growing up in the 60s and 70s, there were very few images or positive images. There were few, but very few, of black people. And so what we, when we saw uh, television or we go in a store or G.I. Joe or something, they were white. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but very, we, there was n not a lot of positive reinforcement. Um, in terms of our ethnicity, particularly if you lived in the South where I grew up, in Atlanta, Georgia. Both of my parents are from South Georgia. They grew up in the Jim Crow South, and I could tell you all some stories. So anyway, we grew up, um, I grew up rather in a low economic area, all black. Um, my elementary school was all black, my doctors were all black, my uh, teachers were all black, everybody was all black. And so I, then eventually, next slide please, I um, became a teenager, and yes, and I grew a big afro. That was the thing, to see how big your afro could grow. And so I thought literally that I was one of the Jackson Five, I, I really did. <laughs> I wanted to be like the Jackson Five. Now, prior to this, uh, you know, I was not a very popular kid, particularly like in middle school and elementary school. Uh, every Friday, I would get my lunch taken from me by the neighborhood bully, and I remember it like it was yesterday. And her name was uh, let's see, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> it was a girl. <laughs> a girl terrorized me. But I always wanted to be a football player, and um, I remember going uh, to my first, trying out for my first team as a middle schooler, and um, I was a tailback because every time I ran out on the field, the coach said, Jenkins, get your tailback over here on this bench and sit down. I was not good at all. But then a wonderful thing happened to me called puberty. <laughs> yes. Now, for most people, that's very uncomfortable, but for me, it was great because I went from sounding like Michael Jackson to Barry White, okay? <laughs> My voice changed, and muscles started coming, and next thing you know, I was playing varsity football, and check out this next picture. I was the quarterback on the football team, yes, and a lot of people say, well, what kind of quarterback were you? I said, well, back in the you know, late 70s, early 80s, uh, uh, if you were a fast athlete and you happen to be a quarterback and if you were black most of the time they would change you to wide receiver or put you on defense now that doesn't happen today all you have to do is look at the nfl you have russell wilson and uh the guy the jackson guy uh out of baltimore and many many uh black quarterbacks but back when i was coming out of high school it didn't matter what kind of numbers you had, what your statistics were. Unless you were 6'3 or 6'4 and you had a prototype bill, you weren't going to play quarterback at a major 
white college in the South. Now, it was a little different in California. Uh, you had Warren Moon at the University of Washington and m many others, but in the South, that wasn't the case. So I started getting recruited. Cal Berkeley, Arizona, Arizona State, Tennessee, Ohio State, Michigan, all these schools were coming at me. And here I was, 17 years old, had everything I wanted, yet my life was empty. There was a huge void there, and I couldn't understand why it was there. I grew up in the church. I made good grades. Everybody liked me. I was a star athlete, but I had a tremendous void in my life. Well, I signed a college scholarship, and I went to the University of Tennessee. Check out this picture. This is me and Reggie White. Yes, yes, Reggie White. Uh, the, uh, he played for the Green Bay Packers, the NFL Hall of Famer. The late Reggie White was my best friend. I was the best man at his wedding. He was in my wedding, and we were really close, and we were fired up for Jesus because my freshman year at the University of Tennessee, I went to a Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting and gave my heart to Jesus. I heard a pro football player speak that day, and he said that all the money, all the fame, all the fortune will never make you happy. And he looked out in the audience. He said, many of you guys are going to be playing in the NFL, and you're going to be making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And let me tell you what, I've been there. It'll never make you happy. The only thing that will fill that void that I know a lot of you have is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> And that is the truth. So I gave my heart to Jesus that day, and my life hasn't been the same since. I got drafted by the NFL, by the New York Giants. Uh, but if you Google me, you won't see anything, because NFL for me stood for not for long, okay? It was, <laughs> I got cut so quick, you all. It was, it was pretty quick. And then I went into the investment business. Check out this next last picture. I was a stockbroker for 25 years uh, with a major firm. Now, why do I tell you all of this? Well, because in 2012, I did something very drastic. After a successful business career, I felt like God was literally calling me to leave it behind and to devote the rest of my life to the local church and to ministry. And it was a very tough decision. Some of my friends thought I was just going through a midlife crisis, but I knew I was doing exactly what the Lord wanted me to do. So we started a church with 20 people. Ten years later, we are 2,500-plus members, and God is using us greatly. Amen. Thank you. So Darren has preached many times at our church, and so I'm just here to, to talk to you a little bit about a very uh, sensitive subject, but I believe if you look at things from God's perspective, then it doesn't have to be a subject that causes a lot of uh, consternation. I believe that Christians are called, because the Gospel of Matthew says so, we're called to be salt and light to the earth. Now, I need you to think about that statement. Back in the Bible days, they didn't have refrigeration. So, if you had meat and you wanted to uh, uh, prepare it later on, uh, then you didn't have a refrigerator to put it in. So, what would they do? They would put salt on the meat in order to keep the bacteria out. And so, that's what we should be. One of the reasons that he compared us to salt is because this world is, um, is, is dying. If you leave meat out, it will spoil. But back in the Bible days, again, salt was used as a preservative. So we are called to get on the meat. The meat is this world. We're called to infiltrate the world and to bring a perspective that is very, very different than what we're hearing now because we're hearing some crazy stuff. I, I can't believe that we're so divided in our country Instead of the United States of America, it's more like the divided states of America. And the last two years have been crazy. I mean, the pandemic, then you have racial unrest and political unrest regarding the, uh, the election. And uh, then, of course, the economy has been crazy. And, and now uh, you're just dealing with all kind of stuff. It's like, when does it end? And then, of course, mass shootings. 
And then, of course, the recent Supreme Court decision regarding Roe versus Wade, and you got some people on one side, some people on the other side, and man, everybody, I've never seen this kind of disunity before. And I'm not saying that we should all agree on all these things. That's, that's not even realistic. But it's like now if you have a different opinion, man, you get attacked. And so we've been attacking each other. And I believe as Christians that we're supposed to make a positive difference. So today I want to talk a little bit. If I had to uh, give you a title, it would just simply be called Let's Get to Know Each Other. Because one of the reasons people don't understand each other is simply because they don't know each other. Again, you don't have to have the same political beliefs, you don't have to be the same ethnicity, but it is so important that we get to know one another. So I'm going to be sharing with you uh, out of John chapter 4. Now let me tell you about John chapter 4, you all. It's long, and I'm not going to be able to go through all 42 verses. If I did, we would be here to 2 or 3 o'clock. But I will tell you about John chapter 4. John chapter 4 takes a lot of twist and a lot of turns. There's a lot of stuff there. There's things in there about race, about culture, about forgiveness, about tradition, about evangelism, about salvation, and much, much more. But the story really centers around Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman. So what I want to do is give you a little bit of backdrop, and then we're going to jump right into the story, and I'm going to give you three things to consider, but I'm going to focus more of this message on the racial aspect. How did Jesus handle people who didn't look like him, who didn't think like him, who had a different background, a, a different experience? Uh, wh was, that, was that even an issue in the Bible days? Oh, yes, it was. It was a big deal. It's a big deal now, and it's always been a big deal, even though it shouldn't be, but it is. So back in 17 rather 722 B.C., 700 years before Christ was born, the northern kingdom of Israel, the northern part of Israel was invaded by a group called the Assyrians. They came in and they took the Jews captive, not all of them, but a whole lot of them, and interracial exchanges, whether romantic or not, began to happen, and a new breed of an ethnic group was born, half Assyrian, half Jew, and this new breed was called a Samaritan. So that's what a Samaritan was back in the Bible days. Y'all know what we hear, the good Samaritan? A lot of people don't even understand, well, what is the, what is the history of Samaritans? Well, it was what happened in, 17, in 722 B.C., when the Assyrians invaded northern Israel. So, the Jews couldn't stand the Samaritans because they didn't have 100% Jewish blood. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans, sort of like in the South, back in the 1950s, 60s, how many white people, not all, but many of them in the South, looked down on black people because black people did not have the rights that white people had back in the 50s and 60s, especially in the South. Well, the Samaritans was that marginalized group. They were the group that uh, couldn't participate in what everybody else did. They were the group that was looked down upon. So the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They looked down on them. But how about this? The Samaritans didn't like the Jews. They didn't do stuff with each other. They didn't go to the same schools. They didn't mingle with each other. They didn't live in the same neighborhoods. They didn't um, drink at the same water fountains. They didn't go to the same bars. They didn't vote the same. They didn't worship the same. They couldn't stand each other. It was a long, volatile history of segregation. Sounds a little similar to America sometimes. So what did Jesus do? to promote racial reconciliation. 
I, I, li I like to use the word racial healing before I use racial reconciliation. I know racial reconciliation is a very popular word, but before you reconcile with someone, that takes a process. There needs to be some healing done. So I like to use the word racial healing because there has been so much injury done to people. And one of the things we have to learn how to do is to deal with the hurt that many people have. So how did Jesus deal with this? What I want to do is just walk you through. There's a lot of verses. I'm going to go through them fast. I really want you, as your assignment this week, to read John chapter 4. Now, again, it's going to take you down a lot of roads, but I want you to look at it from an ethnic and a racial standpoint because I think this is a pretty powerful passage, and it's a lot we can learn from. You all ready? All right, let's go. All right, so what did Jesus do to promote racial healing and unity? Number one, he was intentional. So you and I have to be intentional. Be intentional. Intentionality is very important. Things just don't happen automatically. If you don't water your lawn, if you don't fertilize your lawn, weeds will eventually come up. If you don't Work hard on your marriage. It won't lead to something good. I've been married 34 years, and I still have to work very hard. If you don't take care of things, it does not get better. So Jesus was intentional. Let's look at John chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and I'll let you know why I said Jesus was intentional about this issue. It says, so he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria along the way. I wish I had a map that I could show you, but Judea was in the south right here. Galilee was in the north. Right in the middle was Samaria. What the Jews would do is they would not go from Judea to Galilee in a straight line because no Jew wanted to be in Samaria. So they would go all the way around to walk extra miles just to avoid the Samaritans. But right here in the text, it says, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, why did he have to go through Samaria? Well, you're going to see in a minute. But you're going to see that Jesus was on a mission. Jesus decided he wasn't going to do what everybody else did. Everybody else avoided the Samaritans. Nobody went through Samaria, but Jesus says, no, I am going straight through Samaria. So what's the point here? Look at this statement. We cannot change what we will not confront. We cannot change what we will not confront. You can't change cancer by ignoring it. You can't deal with sexual harassment without ignoring it. You can't deal with gun control without ignoring it, by ignoring it, rather. That's what I meant to say, by ignoring it. Um, the racial climate won't change much if we just ignore it. We have to be very intentional. So I just have a couple of questions I want to ask. How intentional have you been when it comes to building cross-racial relationships? I want you to think about that one. Ask yourself, well, have I been intentional about it or have I just been waiting on it just to happen, just out of the blue? Now, it can happen out of the blue, but most of the time you have to have some intentionality about it. Here's another question. How many people of a different race have you sought out to build a relationship with? Another way is, do you have a black friend? If you're black, do you have a white friend? Do you have a Latino friend? Do you have an Asian friend? I could go on and on. Or does everybody look like you? Now look at this question. Does everyone in your telephone contact list look like you? Think about that. 
Then lastly, have you ever had a person of a different race over to your house for dinner? Our church started a, uh, a program called Conversations. It's where predominantly African-American churches partnered with predominantly white churches, and we did it in small groups. We mixed the groups up so it would be very diverse, and we did four weeks of small groups just talking about race from a biblical perspective. I helped organize it, and the first meeting had to be at a black person's house. The second meeting had to be at a white person's house, and then the third or fourth meeting could be anywhere that was convenient for the group. What we found out is most white people had never been in a black person's home, and I had no idea that that was the case, and it was, it was pretty amazing. So Jesus was willing to do something that the other Jews were not willing to do. So my question to you, if you want to be like Jesus in this area, you have to be intentional. The second thing Jesus did to promote racial healing and unity is um, we must engage each other socially. So you're intentional, and then well, what are you intentional about? You're intentional about engaging people socially really engaging them socially. Well, one of the ways Jesus did that, you all, is by starting with what they had in common, not by starting with their differences. In these small groups that we had, we made up a rule, and that is you could not talk about politics until the third week. Even if it came up, you couldn't mention a president's name, a former president's name. Nobody could talk about it. And they were like, oh, that's going to be so difficult. But you couldn't talk about it. By the third week of that small group meeting, you could talk about it. And boy, did they talk about it. And guess what? There were no bad arguments. And there were some diverse opinions and perspectives. The Republicans were still Republicans. The Democrats were still Democrats. But all of a sudden, they had a very civil conversation. How did that happen? The reason it happened is because those first two meetings, they got to know each other. They got to hear each other's stories. They got to learn about each other's history. So by the time they started sharing about the sensitive things, there was just more empathy there and more understanding. So that's the power of relationship. One of the reasons we can't deal with these sensitive things is because we don't have relationship with people. So let's look at what Jesus did. And I got to go fast here. In verses 5 and 6, John chapter 4, eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar. Remember I told you he went straight to the village. He didn't go all the way around the loop. Near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily behind the well about noontime. Now, this is interesting. They mentioned Jacob's name a couple of times. They mentioned the well a couple of times. What's the deal with Jacob's well? Well, Jacob's well was like the Starbucks. It's where everybody hung out. And Jacob was revered by the Jews and by the Samaritans. So, Jesus built a bridge of communication by starting with what he and the Samaritan woman could agree upon. He didn't start with the things that they disagreed upon. He started with what they had in common. Well, let's see what happened in verses 7 and 9. In John chapter 4, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised. Now, here it is, you all. This is why race is all in this story. It says the woman was surprised. Well, why? For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? In other words, she was saying, haven't you been around? Don't you know about our history? Don't you know we're not supposed to be hanging out with each other and, 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 and giving each other water and drinking behind each other? We're not even supposed to be socializing. But here are some of the things that we can learn from this exchange that Jesus had with this woman. 
Uh, the first thing I want you all to consider that Jesus did, that I believe we need to do, is Jesus stepped out of his racial comfort zone. So he entered her world. Now, I will say this. That's a, it's easier, and I'm generalizing here, for minorities to enter the majority world sometimes than it is for the majority world to enter the minority world. In other words, if I just look at it black and white, I'll just use that as an example. It's a lot easier sometimes for blacks to integrate and to assimilate into a predominantly white culture because we've had to learn how to do that our entire lives. But it is a little bit more difficult for many in the majority culture to assimilate into a minority culture or black culture. So that's why one of the things we feel called to do at our church is we want to make diversity a two-way street, not just a one-way street, not just minorities coming into the majority environment, which is good. I applaud that and celebrate that. But I would love to see it also the other way, where the majority culture is going into minority environments. And so Jesus stepped out of his comfort zone. Another thing, Jesus was willing to have intimate fellowship with her, not just window dressing. He asked her for a cup of water. Now, some theologians say that back in those days, once you drew water from a well, you had a little bucket or a cup. And if somebody asked you for water, you had to give them that bucket or cup. And what they would do is take that cup and they would drink the water and they would give it back to you and say, thank you. So Jesus, a Jew, was willing to put his Jewish lips and mouth on a Samaritan cup. That was unheard of. That was like in the 1950s. You did not have black and white people drinking from the same water fountain. But Jesus, he broke all the rules. He did not care about that. But then the third little thing I, I got from this text is Jesus remained a Jew. He, he didn't discard who God made him. So uh, how did she know he was a Jew? Because she called him a Jew. Well, he must have looked like a Jew or had a Jewish accent or he must have dressed like a Jew. What's the point here? You can still be who you are. Bring who you are into the relationship. <laughs> if you're black, you don't have to try to act white. If you're white, you don't have to try to act black. If you're Asian, you don't have to try to act Latino. Bring your history, all of that, into the relationship. I mean, that's what I did when I went to college. It was the first time when I went to the University of Tennessee that I was ever around white people. I had been in a black environment my entire life. And now I'm sitting in a class, 100 people, and I'm the only black in there. And it was just interesting. And next thing you know, I'm listening to country music. <laughs> it's like, my parents are like, what has gotten into you? An inner city R&B guy listening to country music? Oh, this is just, he's gone too far. But the bottom line, some of them rubbed off on me, and some of me rubbed off on them, and we both made each other better. So, y'all, in verses 10 through 18, I don't have time to go through it, but it's pretty incredible because Jesus tells this lady, I can give you a water, and you'll never thirst again. And she thinks he's talking about, like, real water. So she said, show me where this water is. But he was talking about himself. And you see, a lot of people are thirsty for material things and for power. And Jesus is saying, he is the one who will supply all of our needs. Then he asked the woman, go get your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're living with now is not even your husband. So he called her out, which brings me to my last point. We must start placing Christ above our culture. Nothing wrong with culture. You should celebrate your culture. God made us different. Um, let me make this statement. The whole issue of color blindness is not necessarily what we should be shooting for. There's nothing wrong with seeing color. It is when you do see color, how do you respond to it? God loves diversity. 
If he didn't, look at the flowers, look at the trees. I mean, he is a God of diversity. God loves diversity. But we can't let who we are override our Christ-likeness. Sometimes culture has to be subordinate to our commitment to Christ. Let me show you why as I come to a close. John 4 and verses 19 and 20. After he called this lady out, look at what she said. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet because he just read her mail. So tell me why is it that you Jews, she's still being racial about it. You Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship. Y'all, there's a whole long story behind this whole thing, but now she's getting theological with him. She's, she's talking about worship, and that's where Jesus drew the line. He says, it's one thing for us to engage socially, but once, once you start, once your culture starts overriding, once you, once you bring your culture into it, and, and you're putting your culture up there with Christ, that's a problem. When you put your politics up there with Christ, that's a problem. When, when you put, uh, yeah, your culture, whether you're black, white, it doesn't matter, up there with Christ, where that is the, the determining factor of how you make your decisions, that is a problem. Although we are Americans, we serve Christ more than America. And we have to realize that. So, in verse 22, he says, Jesus says, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. In other words, Jesus says, how you've been worshiping is wrong. You must worship God in spirit and in truth, he goes on to say. And then he goes on to tell the lady, and then the lady said, look, she starts getting frustrated. Oh, you know what? When the Messiah comes, he's going to explain all of this to us. And then he says, I am the Messiah. And something must have hit her. I, I, what I think, and I'm just using my sanctified imagination, she's like, this Jewish guy's talking to me. He's showing me value. He's read my mail. <laughs> you know, and he's been kind to me. He wanted to drink after me. And, and it just hit her. He is the Messiah. Look at this statement, and I'll share one more verse, and we'll close. There cannot be a stronger commitment to culture than to God's truth. So she was confronted with God's truth. All the stuff she talked about, her ancestors worshiping here, worship there, Jesus said, hey, that's cool. I am the Messiah. You, who, those who worship me was worship me in spirit and in truth. I know your granddaddy might have done it this way. I know your, you, you know your grandmother might have done it this way. Okay, I respect that, but here it is. I am the Messiah. So I have a couple of questions for you. Are you putting your race above righteousness? Are you putting your politics above someone else's personhood? Are you more Democrat than disciple? Are you more Republican than righteous? Be careful not to put your political beliefs and your culture on the same level of your faith. They're not the same. They're, obviously, there are intersections, absolutely, but they're not the same thing. Well, let's see what happened after this lady encountered Jesus. Great story, you all, verses 39 through 42. This lady went back to her village, and look at what happened. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village. Now, this is the same person who's a Jewish person who never hung out in Samaria. Now they're begging him to stay. So he stayed for two days. He had a sleepover for two days, Jesus did long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, meaning the Samaritan woman, these are her neighbors, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. So, what 
you and I do relationally. In the race area and all of these other things, if you don't handle it well, you can actually drive people away from Christ. But if you allow God to use you, then who knows what he can do? So I'm just here to challenge you, to ask you not to go along with the crowd, to be intentional. Even when somebody has a different viewpoint of you, to love them and build a relationship with them. I'm asking you to do what Jesus did with the Samaritan woman. Get to know someone, and then God can use it tremendously. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word that is so explicit. It, it talks about everything. So now, Lord, we want to be like you. What would Jesus do in 2022 with all this political unrest, racial unrest, economic turmoil? Lord, we want to represent you in everything we do. Help us to do that, Lord. Thank you for this incredible church and their pastor. And Lord, we ask that you will use New Vintage Church to be a light and to be salt to the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you. I told Lee, uh, I only let him come every once in a while because if he comes too often, you guys are going to want him instead of me. So he's a once in a while guy. Uh, but I'm so grateful. It's so good. What hung in the balance for that Samaritan village, had Jesus not gone through there, they would have never met him. They wouldn't have known him. And what hangs in the balance of our willingness to meet with and get to know people who look different than us, we have no idea what hangs in the balance of our decision to get to know people who are not like us and show them, like we started today, God loves you. We're excited about what God's going to do here. So grateful for people like Lee who are serving us. We have another speaker next week that you're going to want to make sure you're here for. Jan Verhalle will be here next week. If you're brand new, if, if, you have, if I haven't met you yet, I want to meet you in the back. If you want to get connected to somebody who can lead you spiritually, send us an email at info at newvintage.org. We'll pair you with a, disciple, a mentor who can help you grow your faith. Uh, and we'll see you guys next week. Kona Ice is outside. Go get your kids. See y'all. Have a good one. On a summer evening.